Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. The text for Maudie Thursday, April 1st, 2021, are Exodus 12, verses 1 through 4 and 11 through 14, or you can read just through 1 through 14. The Psalm is 116, 1 and 2, and then 12 through 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 through 26. And the Gospel is the 13th chapter of John, verses 1 through 17, and then skipping over to 31 through 35. And that skipping over, I think I say this every year, but I am going to say it again. Uh, is the what you skip over, of course, is uh, Judas's betrayal. And uh, and I that that's an important aspect of this text for uh, several reasons. One is that surrounding the love commandment <laughs> that you have in thirty one to thirty five is Judas's betrayal and Peter's denial. And so that casts the, the, that love commandment in a completely different light, that, that this call to love is a call to love your betrayer and love your denier. Uh, and, and so I, I bristle at uh, attempts to sentimentalize this mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, this and, and to equate the the kind of love that Jesus shows with foot washing. It's, it's uh, way, way, way bigger than that. And uh, it's the love that we've talked about since the beginning of the gospel, for God so loved the world. What does that mean? What does that look like? And the first thing that Jesus does is take his disciples to Samaria. That's the world. And then here it's loving, it's, it's what kind of love are you showing the, the one who will walk out on you uh, and the one who will um, actually not deny Jesus, but deny his own identity as a disciple in, in the gospel of John. And so that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, you know, that to recognize that Judas's betrayal is not handing Jesus over. Uh, it because Jesus does that himself in John. He walks out of the garden and says, hey, if you're looking for me, let these men go. His betrayal is to abandon the relationship, to leave the relationship that, that Jesus has offered him and that Jesus has invited him into. His betrayal is to walk out, to, um, to leave that, leave Jesus and leave the community. That's the betrayal. And so... Uh, that's, uh, I think the, those two correctives <laughs> when it comes to this passage um, are, are important, but also lend a lot of homiletical, uh, I think, possibilities in thinking about what does this last night mean? It's another crisis moment uh, that we've talked about with the Gospel of John. It's another moment where Judas makes, you know, makes the decision to leave. Um, and Peter will make the decision to deny his identity as a disciple, so. And if you tie that back to what you were saying a couple of weeks ago, Caroline, about being driven out of community, mm -hmm. in this particular moment, it is, as you just said, a choice to not accept the invitation to be in this community or to deny that you are a part of this community, of this community of, yeah. of, of Christ followers. So yeah, and that, that, yeah that's another context link. Right, exactly. And the verb, you know, that you get in, uh, in, in 1330, he went out, mm -hmm. you know, ex Ericomai, he went out. And, and then that just like, and it was night. That should just like hit you in the gut that it was night because what has happened is 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 that choice of darkness mm -hmm. um, and moving into the darkness uh, I like to say Judas has gone to the dark side but it's <laughs> but yeah but that's and that and we're put we're we're put there that's where that's where we're supposed to be 
-hmm. that night. And so to, 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 uh, you know, our, it's not, it's not just that Jesus washes the disciples feet. We're meant, meant to be, our, could we be, a, could we be Judas? Could we be Peter? Who are we? And, um, and we also miss in leaving out those verses, we miss 1323 yeah. of the introduction of the beloved disciple, mm -hmm. and which is the first time the beloved disciple is ever mm -hmm. mentioned in the Gospel of John. And he's lying on the bosom of Jesus, mm -hmm. which is from 118. Jesus is on the bosom of God. Mm -hmm. That's who we are. We are lying on the bosom of Jesus. That's the, we are the beloved disciple. And, and we're watching all of this. <laughs> um, who is going to be the betrayer? Who is going to be the denier? Looking around. And so that's what a sermon on this passage should do. It's not just wash people's feet and everything's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. um, so if that's a, that, but that's a whole different thing than First Corinthians. So that's the direction you go. Well, I'll take that as oh, I was going to take that as an invitation to talk about First Corinthians. Yeah, then. that's great. Go for it. Do it. Beautiful segue. Obviously, you've got the, the the New Testament readings at least support three different big themes, and we talk about this every year. You can do foot washing, you can do New Commandment, you can do Communion, Last Supper, or all three. But we've got three very weighty. Um, kind of textual themes coming up there with with Old Testament roots, of course, as well. So the the thing the thing I don't like about the the First Corinthians eleven reading is it's it, it, the way it pulls this almost as a liturgy that's just ripped out of First Corinthians and then can be transported. Which, in some ways, it is. Paul is reciting here. Uh, worship practices and language that he himself has heard from somebody else. He's not inventing this. This is already in circulation, it appears. But Paul presents this in the midst of dealing with particular crisis in Corinth that's around not just rude behavior, but around a kind of stratified way of importing cultural norms into worship that Paul thinks isn't just a bad idea, isn't just counterproductive to the gospel, but thinks actually defiles the body and blood of Christ. And, and that's worth talking about, maybe not tonight on Monday, Thursday, or during lunch hour, whenever you have your service, but it's worth talking about the ways in which the supper is Christ freely giving, Christ hosting a table, Christ making sure everybody is filled, yes, but also a place for self-examination also a place where reconciliation can begin to take place. Also a place where you look around and there can be absolutely no preferred seating at this meal. There can be absolutely no preferred diet or, or, or you know, better meal than somebody else gets at this. You know, and for Paul, who sometimes for a lot of students, they read Paul and they think this guy sure is inconsistent. You know, some things really bug him and other injustices seem to just bounce right off of him. Well, let's stop and explore. Why is this such a big deal for him? And it's because something about Christ's work, Christ's final meal, is this radical opening up of Christ's own self um, to the point where we become his body as opposed to just feasting on it. Anyway, so just, just to explore that so people don't come into Monday, Thursday thinking, oh, this is where the ritual comes from, <laughs> right? But they get a sense of what the ritual is about and they can carry that forward into other times they practice it. I'm glad you brought that up, Matt. I mean, as I understand, the way I put First Corinthians together, it's, I can't remember if it was uh, Hayes who said, Richard Hayes who said, you know, it's really good that the uh, Corinthians were such a hot mess uh, because if, because Paul then goes back to all the basic teachings of the faith in the, uh, in the first century to, to, to try to correct them. And so therefore we had, Without that, we wouldn't have all these early teachings that Paul uh, summons up. So, you know, um, but what that does then, as you're pointing out, is Paul is saying, okay, here's, here, here's, here's what the Lord's Supper is. And it's, it's not just that um, in it we get the forgiveness of sins in the body and blood of Christ, but that that is is forming a certain type of community. Mm -hmm. And I, I do think that that, I mean, that's what you're saying, I think, in part, is that Paul 
Paul is bringing this out to say, look, the very thing that brings us together on uh, for Sabbath worship is uh, is a thing that's forming a certain type of community that you're not being right now. Mm -hmm. um, the the thing that makes this of the of the different themes, you know, for Monday Thursday, the, the three you mentioned, Matt, and then the one Caroline about betrayal, you know, I mean these these big themes. Um, the thing that makes this one hard this year is um, whether or not people are gathering and how different churches, congregations are or are not making the sacrament available. Uh, you know, um, that some, um, my church, uh, the, the congregation I'm a part of, uh, we, uh, our leadership encourages us to have bread and wine and that when they, when the words are spoken then that we, stop and eat and drink uh, as you know as a family um others have said no don't do that and so it's this particular theme might be hard this year but i do think even if that theme is hard because people are not gathering um i still think the type of community that christ is bringing together in the the church is i think that's really still a powerful theme mm. Well, and, and maybe the, the reality of, of likely of many people will be having this meal in their homes and not in, um, in church, not among a community. It invites, that, it invites a moment of that kind of reflection of, of um, when, you know, when, when we're used to a kind of roteness or ritualist, ritualisticness about uh, how we have had uh, communion in the past, and yet now it's dining room table or maybe your kitchen counter or whatever. Uh, how it, how is that inviting a different kind of reflection on why am I doing this and uh, why why is this important? Why is why is this continuing? What is it? What, how is it going to make me feel uh, uh, different about about this kind of community that I'm I'm uh, that I'm a part of and and what how that community moves out how as a member of that community that community moves out into the world so I, it could yeah I think it could be a really uh, different kind of reflective time if that's the direction you tend to want to go on this evening and setting up that context again uh, that it wasn't a small ritual of you know a cracker and a a shot glass of wine but that it truly was a table, a meal, as Matt was describing. And um, um, so maybe having this meal in your home um, where it's a meal um, will allow that recognition of the practice that is actually having. I, I have to admit, um, I'm, I'm one of those who um, not being able to gather for communion has heightened my desire to return to community and have it. Um, but a few weeks ago, uh, a congregation that I'm a part of online, um, the pastor preached an, an incredibly powerful sermon on um, loving the betrayer. I mean, that wasn't the text, but to pull into what we've talked about from the text uh, for, for this Sunday uh, or for this Thursday is, is loving the betrayer, loving the outsider, loving the enemy, loving the one that we're not supposed to be connected to, and then led to a, a service of communion where I literally went and got something to eat because he had called this community together. And I want it to be at that table that the virtual worship service had invited me into, not because I wanted to repeat the ritual, but because I want it to be a part of this redeemed community. And I think if people can take the words that we've talked about for this particular uh, Monday Thursday and to draw people in to the recognition of the division, the brokenness, and the need for, uh, for Christ's grace, and then to say, but this invitation is extended to us, where we do that in a way that people say, hold on, I got to go get my fork. I think that would be a wonderful Maudie Thursday service. <laughs>